What we, of course, have read together is the account of the great flood of Noah. I think it was useful to read that together because it's always useful to read the scriptures on the one hand, but also because many of the points that were raised in there show us that this had to be a worldwide deluge, a flood that covered the face of the entire earth. Any people who are going to try to integrate an old age view into Genesis chapter 1 are not going to have a worldwide flood. They're going to have to explain this away as a local flood in the Mesopotamian basin, perhaps a flash flood in the area that Noah lived, taking away a few villages maybe, but nothing like what we read. And so again, to be true to scripture, we put the Bible in the middle and the truth of God at the center and everything has to fit around that. What we're going to find out today, though, is that the fossil evidence and the rocks of the earth, although if you use the eyes, I talked about the worldview, the glasses of a person who is uniformitarian and atheistic in orientation, they may come up with a different view of some of these matters. Yet, to be fair, our worldview certainly fits as well. And I'm going to show you that there are a number of processes in the earth that we can actually measure today using uniformitarian principles even against them and show that we get a far younger age of the earth and we also get abundant evidence of a universal worldwide flood within the last 10,000 years. This is the story of Noah. I can't uh, restrain myself ever from showing chiasms when I find them. And so this shows the beautiful literary structure of Genesis chapter 6, verse 10 through 9, 19. A chiasm is named after the Greek letter he or chi, which is shaped like an X. Of course, you're not seeing the entire X, you're only seeing the left side of the X as it moves in from A to B to C to D, all the way into a central turning point, a pivot or a hinge, we might call it. And then the whole process is reversed in very careful reverse order so that what is said first is also what is said last. What is said second is said second to the last and so on, all the way to the crux. The hinge or the turning point is always God's main point. God remembered Noah. So while this is a complicated slide and lengthy, I just want to read the entries together so you can see how beautiful the Spirit of God, how beautifully the Spirit of God comprised and composed this section. Noah and his sons are mentioned first and last. All life on earth is alluded to next. Curse on the earth is balanced by blessing on the earth at the end. The ark is then mentioned. All living creatures are then mentioned. Food is then the next topic. The animals being in man's hand would be the next entry. The entrance into the ark is balanced by the exit from the ark. The waters increasing is balanced by the waters decreasing. The mountains being covered is reversed by the mountains being visible. And then finally, in the middle, we have the key expression, God remembered Noah. If you think that's cool, there are many of these in the book of Genesis and throughout the scriptures. You just have to look for them. All right, so one of the problems we have in being apologists for a worldwide flood are these kinds of pictures, which trivialize and basically turn the story into something that fits better into Mother Goose or a children's uh, tales uh, book, whatever you do. You have Mother Goose over here, I suppose you do. So these giraffes are having a nice time on the aft part of the boat, but if there were to be a wave of any size, they probably would topple over into the ocean. And you know, the whole thing is meant to appeal to children, but we have to remember that what we are dealing with here is far more serious. On the left, we have another children's account and that rainbow, which of course is part of the story. On the right, I managed to find this. It was in my first Bible I got in the early, uh, mid-1960s. And I found the very same image online and couldn't resist throwing it in. That one takes the ark a little more seriously. But we want to actually look at what the scripture says about the ark for a few minutes. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30. So using uh, a cubit, uh, there are different cubits. A cubit, as you know, is the distance between your elbow and your fingertip. But then your cubit and mine are somewhat different. So there isn't a standard cubit. They vary in length from 17 to 21 inches approximately. Using the longer cubit, the ark was about 515 feet or 160 meters. The beam of it, that's the width from, the, from port to starboard, 86 feet. 
The depth of it uh, is 51 feet, and the draft of it about 25 feet. So a very large vessel. Here's another depiction of it showing the same dimensions. The old Babylonian cubit of 20.5 inches is what's being used in this case to come up with these dimensions. There have been various models of the ark built. Uh, this is an example of one, but of course the large ark built in the Netherlands and then an even uh, perhaps even more to scale version that was built in Kentucky in the United States are available if you're willing to make a pilgrimage <laughs> to either of those places. You can see exactly how large this vessel was. Here's a comparison of the ark with some other well-known vessels. The Santa Maria was one of the three ships that Columbus brought over to the New World. The Wyoming was the largest fore-aft rigged wooden vessel ever built to my knowledge. Um, and it is about 400, 400 feet long if you include the spit out the front. The Titanic, of course, was just over 800 feet, and the Queen Mary II is well over 1,000 feet, in fact, over 1,100 feet. You can see the Ark compares pretty respectably with those. It was perhaps one of the largest wooden vessels ever built, and nothing of its capacity was built until the 1800s, and so it really has an outstanding place in ship history. Again, just some dimensions here. We're looking at a 747 and the size of some large animals, like an element, elephant rather in a giraffe, and the size of the largest dinosaurs. And you can see that the ark, in this case being said to be 437 feet, that's a different dimension using a shorter cubit, is still very amply able to carry the few thousand species that Noah would have, to, would have had to take into the ark. Here it's compared to an American football field of 100 yards, and you can convert that to soccer or your football if you want, but you can see that it is a very large vessel. Um, this I did meant, meant to suppress, but I didn't, so we're going to go through it. I find these build slides rather annoying, but um, we'll move through it. I like this one. This is what we call the local flood theory, because it turns out the Mesopotamian basin is not a bowl. If it were a bowl, you could fill it with water and that would work. But in order to have a local flood, you need a second miracle called the wall of water. And you can see that um, God is capable of doing this. We believe when the children of Israel passed through the Red Sea, God did exactly that. But there is no evidence in the story that we read. In fact, there's plenty of contrary evidence that the flood was nothing like that. So this artist is basically showing how um, really unscriptural and unreasonable it is to have any sort of lo local flood theory. You certainly could not satisfy all the requirements that the text that we read demands. One of the things about floods is that they are part of the histories of all peoples and all continents, showing that this tradition, which goes way back to the beginning of time, obviously, was well known by peoples throughout the world. I don't expect you to read that whole list. I'm not going to read it to you, except to show that every one of the continents is represented, including even Pacific Islands and far-flung places. Everyone knew about the flood and wrote about the flood and continued to talk about the flood in their legends. If you make a chart, what we see here are along the top the various peoples from Assyrio-Babylonian days all the way to the Hawaiian Islands on the right. And then we have certain features which I'm going to read for you. And you can see on the chart that many of these are either fully represented or at least partially represented in the histories of these peoples. For example, Many of them speak of a man in transgression or men in transgression, the sin of the world being the cause of the flood. It was a divine destruction, but there was a favored family. An ark was provided. That's pretty much universal. The destruction was by water. Humans were saved. Animals were saved. The destruction was universal in its scope. The boat landed on a mountain. Birds were sent out. Survivors worshipped and God continued to favor those who came out of the ark. Perhaps the most ancient of these traditions comes from Babylon. This is old Babylon, and fragments have been count, found which tell the story. Some people think that uh, this was handed down from Amraphel, a king who is mentioned in Genesis 14, verse 1. Another account that was prevalent in the Neo-Babylonian era was well known by Alexander the Great. Here is actually the story of the flood, uh, in a cuneiform document. 
It says the gods led by Enlil agreed to cleanse the earth of an overpopulated humanity, but Utnapishtim, who is Noah, was warned by the god Ea in a dream. He and some craftsmen built a large boat. It was one acre in area and had seven decks in a week. He then loaded it with his family, the craftsmen, and the seed of all living creatures. The waters of the abyss rose up. It stormed for six days. Even the gods were frightened by the flood's fury. Upon seeing all the people killed, the gods repented and wept. The waters covered everything but the top of, Mount, of the mountain Nisur, where the boat landed. What you see in this are hints of truth, grotesque exaggerations, an extremely unseaworthy vessel of an acre in size. I suppose it might be seaworthy if it was possible to make a boat that big, um, and seven decks. And yet, the seeds of the original story are clearly present. Here is Utnapishtim and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Noah, uh, from Neo-Assyrian archaeology. And so they send out a sparrow and then a raven, which did not return. Again, we see very similar hints to the true story. Here is a legend from China, the other side of the world. He King tells the story of Fu He, whom the Chinese consider to be the father of their civilization. Fu He, his wife, notice this, his three sons and three daughters escaped a great flood. He and his family were the only people left on the earth, alive on the earth at the time of the flood. And then they repopulated the earth. There's an ancient temple in China that has a wall painting that shows Fu He's vessel in the raging flood waters. Dolphins are swimming around, and again, a dove with an olive branch in its beak is flying toward it. The ancient Chinese pictogram for a boat, now again, the Chinese do not use alphabets, which represent sounds or phonemes, but rather they create pictures, right? And these strokes all have ancient meaning. Some of these are thousands of years old. The ancient picture for a boat is the combination of eight Mouths, which by synecdoche stands for eight people in a vessel. Where does eight come from? From the story of Noah. In fact, in Chinese pictographs, we have a number of ancient truths that are preserved by this people far on the other side of the world from Palestine. Creation in ancient Chinese is comprised of the following components. Dust plus life plus Mouth plus motion. So the dust, the breath of life from God's mouth producing motion is their symbol for creation. Forbidden is comprised of the following components. Tree of knowledge, tree of life, command from God, forbidden. So the word from forbidden is a clear remembrance in their culture of the story of Genesis Chapter 3. Ship, we've already seen, is comprised of the following elements. Boat plus eight plus mouths, that is family members, equals a ship. Righteousness is to raise a lamb above us. Lamb above me is righteousness. I could go on and on. You can find whole books and slide presentations on this material. It's very fascinating. Going then into the Hawaiian Islands, you see another story of a man. It's kind of a catamaran boat, which would be typical of these island people. But again, without going into all the details, it's another reminder that these stories tell us that everyone in the world knew about a worldwide flood. This is from Mexico and a rather unseaworthy looking vessel again, but again, preserving the basic elements of the truth. Another feature of the Mexican story is birds, but they got their birds a little bit mixed up. When the waters abated, the man sent out a vulture, but the bird found plenty of corpses to eat and didn't return. Other birds also flew away and didn't return. Finally, he sent out a hummingbird, which returned with a green bough in its beak. So again, this is the last one. This is Ojibwe Indians, also called Chippewa Indians from around the area that I live in north. And they have a story that's very similar of a universal flood. So. Does that prove that there was a universal flood? I think from an historian's point of view, it does. What we find, though, is the Bible account, which was written down, is the one that makes the most sense. It is the most sane. It is the one that talks about things that are really very reasonable, a vessel that is highly seaworthy, 
And of course, it comes from the mouth of a God who cannot lie, whose word we have come to know and to trust. Some of these accounts are older. And so people say, well, the Bible borrowed its account, you know, from Utnapishtim. Uh, that is clearly not true. Remember, the Bible was a compilation of truth that the children of Israel had carried for many hundreds of years since their beginning, and which prior to that had been handed to them by the patriarchs. The reason for the writing of the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, was for a people who had come out of Egypt and were traveling through a wilderness so that they might know the God who had rescued them. And they might know how to approach him and worship him when they entered into the land of promise. And that they might be protected not only from the gods of Egypt, which they had left, but from the gods of Canaan that they would meet. And that they would know their God. And to know your God includes, of course, to know where you come from and the fact that you were made in his image. And so these are the important reasons why Genesis was written. It was not written to be a scientific textbook. And yet, because it comes from a God who cannot lie, everything it says relating to history or science is true. Now, when we come to the geologic column, and today's presentation, by the way, is a little bit of a tossed salad, you might say, a smorgasbord. We have a number of different topics. They're loosely related by being uh, probably fossil or old or the age of the earth arguments. We're going to start with this geological column. Now, the story goes that at the very bottom you have rock that existed in the very, very early earth, 4.5, 4.6 billion years ago, that contained no life. But then, of course, life evolved spontaneously, and very early life forms, the smallest microscopic single-cell organisms might not have survived. But then, by the time you got to anything that was fossilizable, anything that could possibly be preserved, you start with very primitive animals, and then you move up to more and more complex, more and more developed, until you finally get up to the tertiary period where you will get mammals and finally man. This makes a great story. The problem, of course, is it's not true. Another issue would be that this kind of geological column with all these wonderful names like Jurassic and Pennsylvanian and Mississippian and Devonian and Silurian, these are found nowhere in this order in a complete form anywhere on the Earth. So this is clearly a compilation and full of assumptions about layering of sedimentary rock on the Earth's surface. We're going to show that the most likely and uh, certainly geologically and scientifically the most valid way to look at the way the layers are formed and the features of those is that they were laid down suddenly in a flood. Now the sorting of animals still can be explained not because of a low form evolving over time into a higher form, but because of different behavior and habitat among the animals that are fossilized. The marine uh, creatures are, of course, expected to be at the bottom. And above that, again, this whole column doesn't exist anywhere, but assuming that there are some general trends that we see in the fossil record, we can make a good story for why, for example, the mammals that are mobile are on the top because they were intelligent, because they moved, and also because even of their body density that would affect what rock layer they were laid down in in a worldwide flood. We must, though, begin with something far simpler, and that is, how do you become a fossil? Most animals that die are consumed. Scavengers take care of the flesh. The bones are left, and they have a certain half-life, and then they disappear. And you would never get the intact animal, but you might get a skeleton if that bone were buried uh, fortuitously, in muck very quickly so that the uh, animal's soft tissues, which would eventually decompose, of course, and be replaced by calcium and other so uh, minerals, it would turn out to be uh, necessary to protect that animal through the entire process of fossilization. So in our picture here, our cartoon, we see a fish who seems to be rather happy until suddenly a wall of sediment comes descending down upon him as part of a worldwide flood. He then loses his little life and he stays there until over time he becomes a fossil. Fossils don't occur unless they are buried quickly. Any fish that is left to lie on the bottom of the ocean will not fossilize. So what is my point? The very presence of fossils begs the question of how they formed. Most animals that die are not fossilized and yet we have vast graveyards of fossils in the sedimentary rock of the earth. How did they get there? We're going to look 
at some of them and, and explain why and how. This is an example of uh, a, a variety of different bones from animals being thrown together and evidence of a worldwide flood, a catastrophe that killed these animals and dumped them and deposited them suddenly, leading to the fossilization of their various skeletal parts. Now, <clears throat> this is a reminder to me to talk about a couple of the features of the fossil record. Whenever an animal or a plant form occurs in the fossil record, it appears suddenly, it stays in the fossil record largely unchanged, and then it continues to the present day or it disappears. There are no transitional forms in the fossil record. I think we need to emphasize this very strongly. A transitional form is some form between one kind of animal and another that would provide evidence that there was evolution in a vertical dimension from one kind to another. Now, let's just use an example of an animal that was going to evolve into a bird. It would need to develop wings for flight. Now, how do you develop wings for flight? Well, that's not straightforward, okay? You have to think about this for a minute. First of all, your entire skeleton has to change because the density of the bone in mammals is far greater than birds. You have to, in other words, lighten the infrastructure. Then, of course, you have to have the wings themselves develop. And you would assume that they would have to begin as wing buds or little appendages like this, right? And then they would have to get longer and longer and longer. And they would have to develop some aerodynamic quality. Perhaps you could stretch skin between the bones of the fingers and create a sheet, something like an airplane wing. We might see that on a pterodactyl dinosaur, right? Or better yet, you might develop feathers and those feathers would provide a number of aerodynamic features that would be useful to you and they would have to grow in the place of hair, right? So you'd have to figure out how to turn one skin appendage into another kind. And then when the thing is fully feathered and formed, you still need hardware and software to run, the, to run this uh, machine, right? So you have to understand how to use your new wings with their new feathers. And so you have to practice, I guess, or the ones that get it figured out survive and the ones that don't figure out what to do with these things hanging off their sides die. Now, if you think about this, the whole way I presented that, it sounds rather ludicrous, I'm sure. Uh, it is, it is, it is my, here's my question. What advantage is there to proto wings that are dragging off the side of my body before I get to the point where I can actually make them work? Would they have any survival advantage to me? If a Tyrannosaurus Rex rounded the next corner and I decided I better run for it, would I be in a better position having two long appendages dragging behind me than I would if I didn't have them at all? Well, I think they would be quite detrimental to me. I would not know what to do with these things that had no purpose until they finally became the wings that would allow me to take off and fly. The whole thing is preposterous just from walking through it and thinking about it. But it becomes doubly preposterous because there is no evidence in the fossil record for a, such a thing as a proto-wing. When a wing appears in the fossil record, it is a fully developed wing in an animal that is fully able to use it. And so everything that appears in the fossil record is a fully intact functioning animal. Don't let them fool you with things like Archaeopteryx, which appears to have some features of a bird and yet has claws and has teeth. The bird's feathers are still feathers in a wing that works perfectly well. The claws are useful claws. The teeth are useful teeth. There are other birds that have claws. There are, like the Hotson, for example, there are birds with teeth. There is nothing particularly unique about Archaeopteryx. It just happens to have features that are not normally seen in the birds that we're used to. But it is not a transitional form. We would call it a mosaic. It has fully developed features that are often associated with different animals in the one animal, and yet none of them is a transitional form. You with me, right? The, the Archaeopteryx isn't turning into anything. It isn't coming from one form. It isn't becoming another. It is simply being what God made it to be. All right? So Colin Patterson, who's the, one of the senior paleontologists at the British Museum, has stated the following. I fully agree with your comments. On the lack of, this is because he wrote a book on evolution and did not talk about transitional forms. Well, that would be heresy to many neo-Darwinians, right? So they would say, 
Why didn't you do that? Don't you know that our textbooks that we feed the children are full of these things? Don't you know that downstairs in the museum where the exhibit hall is, we're teaching this. Now, why don't you put it in your textbook? He said, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of direct illustration of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. Yet Gould, that's Stephen Jay Gould, and the American Museum people are hard to contradict when they say there are no transitional fossils. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil for which one could make a watertight argument. Now, you know, Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge, and I showed Eldridge yesterday, came up with a theory called punctuated equilibrium, which means that for most of the period of time and most of what you can see in the stratigraphic record, you will not find trans transitional forms because they didn't occur. It was not a gradualistic process, according to them. Rather, what happened is, after long periods of no evolution, there would be a surge of evolution, a large amount of it in a very small time. That would be the punctuations in an otherwise long story of equilibrium. So we call that punctuated equilibrium or punk eek for short, all right? Now, when that happened, it happened in a geographically small area in a small slice of time. So of course, by chance, it would be very unlikely that you would find these transitional forms because they're not evenly spread out through time. They're not evenly spread out through the stratigraphic record, but instead they are found in little tiny pockets and you just haven't been fortunate enough to find one of those pockets yet. Now, is this not a strange way for science to proceed? Arguing from lack of evidence and creating a just so story that has no basis in any fact, and in fact is contradicted by the very record that they're trying to use to prove their case. What we do find, and again, just a couple of quick slides on this before we move on, is a sudden explosion of life in what they call the Cambrian level. Everything fully formed, everything fully functional. Sea creatures on the bottom because the bottom was the sea at the beginning and everything was layered, and layered on top of that. Again, to make this point, evolution would predict the beginning of life and then the divergence of life into different forms until finally the different forms themselves would be distinguishable and they would all evolve separately. What you find in Earth is only above the line, everything below the line is a fiction, it doesn't exist. This is uh, partly an age of the Earth argument, but I'm going to show it now because it's part of the fossil record. We now know that there are intact blood vessels and there are soft tissue elements in dinosaur bones. Given that DNA cannot last more than 10,000 years, we ask how can these dinosaurs be millions of years old? There is no answer for this from the other side. There in the picture here you see from Tyrannosaurus rex a red blood cell. You see blood vessels that are still pliable. If you take them with tweezers and pull on them, they spring back. They are thousands of years old, but they are not tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of years old. This is a complete contradiction to everything that they say about the age of dinosaurs, and they have no answer for it. And by the way, this is not just one odd specimen. It was not found by a creationist who published it and then wouldn't let anyone else observe it. Independent laboratories have multiply looked at these specimens. Here's one from 2009 from a duck-billed dinosaur that contains soft tissue structures. And the analyses done by multiple labs show collagen, elastin, hemoglobin, and osteocytes, none of which could last more than 10,000 years. We also have a number of evidences of the flood. Uh, one of them would be ammonite fossils on the top of the Himalayas of Nepal. You say, wow, the flood must have been pretty deep if it went 29,000 feet plus, 15, plus 25 or 15 cubits, right? On the top of the highest mountain. But of course, Mount Everest didn't exist before the flood. The whole purpose of the flood in part was to disrupt the surface of the earth and to change its topography. So what was high became low and what was low became high. And what was a plain might have gone higher to perform the very high Alps and the high Himalayan mountains that we have today. The Bible says the mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them in Psalm 104. What we see here are ammonite fossils, sea creatures, and these come from the very high parts of the Himalayan mountains. There's no explanation for those. My point, what is my point? There's no explanation for those in a uniformitarian geology. 
Again, we talked about this yesterday, but when you have vast sheets of sandstone laid, laid, laid down across thousands of miles, you can't explain that from a uniformitarian principle. That is, that this all happened gradually by the processes that we see today operating in the past at the same rate. This is part of the Grand Canyon formation. And you see here the Tapete Sandstone, which, if you cross the Atlantic, is picked up again and goes all the way through the Middle East and is the same sandstone that the city of Petra in Palestine is made of. Can you explain that from anything but a worldwide flood? You can't. The red wall limestone you have in your own country here of England, it's the same rock layer. It used to be contiguous, it is now separated. These layers were not laid down by any uniformitarian process, they are the result of a universal deluge. Uh, another couple of features I was going to point out is that if they were thousands or millions of years apart, you would expect them not to be so perfectly even in their distribution with no disruptions from one layer to another. Water is a wonderful sorter. Hydrological sorting is an amazing thing. You put stuff in a flood and let it go and let it go to the end of its uh, flow and abate and you will find highly organized layers uh, according to mass and dense, uh, density and other features. Again, there's no uniformitarian explanation for this. This is a fossil graveyard. You can see these nautiloids, which are uh, animals that are uh, found in the limestone of the Grand Canyon, obviously deposited suddenly. The school was brought together and it was deposited suddenly. The animals' bodies are all oriented on the same axis, showing that they were being pulled along by water that was flowing at a high rate of speed and then they were fossilized as the sediment suddenly buried them. You find this, we're going to talk about this later, this is the folding of rock. When's the last time you were able to fold a rock? Okay, what happens when you try to fold a rock? Well, first of all, you can't do it because it's way stronger than you are. But if you got the prop proper tools and decided you were going to fold it, it would break. It would not fold. The only way you can fold rock and make it bend and do a hairpin turn is if it is soft. So these rock formations were formed when they were soft. So there can't be millions of years between the layers. They were all laid down within weeks. And we have abundant evidence of this in the Mount St. Helens eruption and other catastrophes that have happened in the modern world that have produced structures that look just like the Grand Canyon, but they did them in weeks. This is from Ireland, actually. A little sop for those of you who are from the Green Island, showing the same thing. Another evidence that these rock layers were laid down suddenly are what we call polystrate fossils. These are tree trunks that are upright through all these different layers. Now, you don't have to be too much of a geologist or know very much about anything, pretty much, to use good old horse sense and figure this one out. How do you get this layer and this layer and this layer being thousands or million years apart when they have a tree trunk growing through them? I rest my case. <laughs> and here's some examples in real life. These are polystrate fossils, tree trunks moving up and down through these various rock layers. To show rapid burial, we're going to show you an ichthyosaur giving birth. She is literally in the process of getting birth when the flood hit and suddenly buried her, allowing for fossilization and the perfectly intact mother and baby right at the moment of birth. There is no uniformitarian explanation for that fossil. Here is a fish in the middle of lunch. Deciding to have this fish for lunch, suddenly the flood came and swept it away and it was suddenly fossilized, well, suddenly deposited and eventually fossilized in the throes of eating something. This is sudden burial, which accounts for these fossils. Here's a jellyfish fossil from Australia. How do you make a jellyfish fossil? Have you ever seen jellyfish on the beach? They start to stink within a day or two of dying and they decompose quickly. And yet this jellyfish has all of its beautiful soft parts preserved perfectly. How does that happen? Only by sudden burial, only by a catastrophe like a flood. So if there were a worldwide flood, what would you expect to find? Billions and billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth, even on top of the highest mountains. That's what you would expect to find. And what do you find? 
Billions and billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the whole earth, even on the top of the highest mountains. That's exactly what you find. You find fossil graveyards, as we've already seen that slide. Another quick uh, evidence here as I need to move on are coal seams. Supposedly there was a bog, and then the organic matter in the bog decomposed, and then it was pressed on by new layers that had arisen over it, and it formed under pressure coal, and now we're free to mine that and use it to burn things, or to burn, to burn it to, to produce energy. Uh, there are big problems with that. These coal seams had to be laid down suddenly because of things like this sort of discontinuity. There's no uniformitarian explanation for why the seam could have a Y in it like that, especially if you think of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years from the top to the bottom of the structure. How can you have coal, an unrelated layer, and then another seam of coal? How can the coal have a Y shape in it unless it is being laid down suddenly? And these are throughout the world. This is one from Germany. These slides need to be reformatted, but they made the point. Now, another thing I want to talk about in terms of age of the Earth and the fossil record has to do with things that scientists do that make it appear that the Earth has to be old. One of the things they like to do is do ice corings in glaciers, and they'll go down 200 feet, and they'll look at all these fine layers, and they'll say, you see, each one of those is a year. We've just gone down 200,000 years of layers. So how can you have an Earth that's 6,000 years old? Uh, they think they can rest their case. But, of course, if we use a little bit of um, common sense, we find that the story is very different from what they're saying. In July 1942, two of these B-17 bombers and six P-38s, that's a P-38, by the way, uh, were en route from the United, Sta United States to Great Britain via Greenland and Iceland they had a severe snowstorm. They had to leave the planes, all eight of them there, and make an emergency landing. And they were re rescued, but the planes were abandoned. That's 1942. 1992, somebody came up with the money to go dig those planes up. How many feet of ice do you think they were under? 260 feet. And throughout those 260 feet were fine layers, which had formerly been interpreted as a year's accumulation. In fact, they had to dig down 260 feet in ice after just 50 years to find these planes. 260 feet of ice accumulating in 50 years gives us a rate that is less than 10,000 years for the entire glacier. And if we make a couple of other assumptions, like the weather on the Earth being different and the snowfall, being greater in the humid conditions following the flood, we could come down to a number much slower than that, 4,000 years. Well, these planes are beautifully restored today. These are the very planes that were under 260 feet of ice. It looks like that glacier is probably only 4,500 years old. We've already done a bit of critique of radioactive dating, and given the time, I'm not going to actually spend too much time on this. But you can see these equations of potassium, which is radioactive potassium-40, will decay into a gas called argon-40. It will give off a positron and an electron, or actually electron and um, some, uh, and another particle. Uranium can de decompose into lead through a series. We don't need to go through it. Rubidium to strontium, samarium to neodymium, different kinds of decay. This was the thing I talked about last night. I think most of you were here. The hourglass analogy, I think, is a useful one to show why these radiometric dating methods are fraught with assumptions that are not provable, unprovable assumptions. And what I want to do is just quickly walk through some examples where we know the age of the rock, or if we don't know what we, in this case, we don't know it, but what we do know is that the different uh, dating methods give radically, wildly, unbelievably different ages for the same rock. This is a bit of Cardenas basalt from the Grand Canyon again. And three da different dating methods were used, and they give wildly different dates. So either one is wrong, sorry, two of them at least have to be wrong, and why not say the third is wrong as well, based on some other information. This is moon rock. Different dating methods vary from 700 million to 28 billion years, and I need to tell you those numbers are nowhere close. They're not close, okay? These are huge numbers. This is Mount Etna in Italy, the most active volcano in Europe, in the island of Sicily. 
There are two eruptions that we know of, and we know of rocks that came from those eruptions, so therefore we know the age of the rock. In eruption number one, 122 BC, the potassium argon dating, isochron dating for that is 250,000 years. Interestingly, the newer eruption in 1972, where the rock is literally less than 50 years old, is uh, said to be even older than the original eruption of 350,000 years. Day site from Mount St. Helens, when, did it, when was it produced? When was the magma, molten magma turned into granite? It was, or day site in this case, 1986. Potassium argon says it's 350,000 years. Due to time, I'm gonna go through these quickly. 1801 eruption is said to be 1.6 million years old. 1915 eruption, producing new rock in 1915 that's 110,000 years old. Here's a sunset crater, equally wildly er erroneous uh, number. And one from New Zealand that's even worse than the usual, 3.7 million years for something that occurred in 1954. And again, another very, very large number for something that came in 59. Here's an example of two different kinds of basalt. One we know must be older by geological principles than the other, but the isochron dating for the younger rock is much older than the older rock. Here's the bottom line. If we have samples of known age, where the radio radiometric dating is not even close to accurate. Why, when we have samples of unknown age, are we suddenly going to believe it? When radiometric dating results do not fit my evolutionary worldview, I make excuses like, quote, lab contamination, and cherry pick other results that I happen to like. We've talked about carbon-14. Again, thanks to Peter for reminding me that my half-life was an order of magnitude off I said it was 57,000 years, it's actually 5,700 years. But you can see how this occurs when an organism dies, the carbon-14 in it is the same. Presumably it was extant in the atmosphere that it was breathing at the time, and in the nutrients that it was ingesting that contained carbon. But from that moment, since no new carbon would come into the organism, as it aged, carbon-14 would go to zero. Now, that seems rather valid, but there are many problems. We can't find any carbon sources uh, below the Pleistocene level that do not have carbon-14 in them. So they can't be as old as people say they are because they're supposedly millions or billions of years. And we have, uh, they say, woman's best friend here. I don't know if that's true. The diamond, okay? And the diamond, there's no way for new carbon to come into a diamond in situ. In other words, in its natural location buried deep in the earth. Now, if the Earth's layers that contain diamonds are over four billion years old, there cannot be carbon-14 left in the diamond. It would long since have decomposed. But in fact, that's what we find. Ergo, these diamonds are only thousands of years old. I have so many other uh, evidences here that I just want to mention. One part of this mammoth, carbon-14 dating is 29,000 years, another part, 44,000 years. Is there a problem there? The skin of this mammoth, it's a different one, is said to be 21,000 radiocarbon years, but its legs are only 15,000 years. That means it died over a process of 6,000 years. Doesn't make sense to me. The mollusk on the left was dated 2,300 years. The problem is it's still alive. The seal on the right, carbon-14. So you can find these. These are easy to pick off the internet. And they all have uh, references in peer-reviewed re review journals. So we're, we're talking about something that's in the open market. How long have people been on the earth? The Bible strongly, strongly supports the notion that it is thousands of years old. This is a common view of earth history that divides it into 7,000 years. 2,000, whoops, 2,000 years from creation to Abraham, Abraham's life we can date quite precisely. So this is how we work back through genealogies to get to the 4,000 or so years prior to the coming of Christ. There are then 2,000 years of the Jewish era, as it's called in this chart, 2,000 years of the Gentile era. Now we're getting close to date setting, and I'm not saying I'm endorsing this slide completely. I present it for your consideration, all right? That means the coming of the Lord is drawing nigh. Then the millennial reign of Christ, misspelled, but I couldn't fix it, is a thousand years. Very interesting, huh? Don't tell 
people that I said that the Lord is coming in 2033, uh, which would be exactly 2,000 years after Christ died. We don't know that. We don't know whether this whole construction is actually accurate. It's just very intriguing. But I said yesterday something I'm going to defend again. The Lord Jesus was a young earth creationist. Because he said, at the beginning, God made them male and female. And at the beginning, Adam and Eve lived. Adam and, Le and, and, Adam and Eve, according to the uh, strict grammatical historical interpretation of the scriptures, must have been around 4,000 years before Christ. Again, another chart showing the same thing. Another scripture to bring into bear, which I mentioned yesterday, is the blood of righteous Abel, which was shed at the foundation of the world. That means Abel was at the very beginning. Uh, James Usher, I'm talking here about the age of the earth. Notice Sir Isaac Newton. We talked about Newton and his science yesterday. He was a Bible scholar and a very upright uh, man throughout his life and wrote more on theology than he wrote about science. Isaac Newton pegged the age of the earth as the age of creation is 4000 BC. He also believed in a real millennium. What's interesting, though, is that just like the flood stories that are throughout the world, the idea that the earth, earth is only a few thousand years old is also believed throughout the different cultures of the world. Here are examples of the age when the earth began, and there's sources on the right to substantiate these, and they're surprisingly close to each other from India, Persia, Egypt, China, and Babylon. Then we have this man, James Hutton. I really I need to move these through these quickly. And his disciple, Charles Lyell. And these men uh, came up with this concept of uniformitarianism. They said there were no catastrophes to speak of. The earth is thousands, millions, billions of years old. Lyell looked at the Niagara Gorge and said it took 800 million years to cut it out. Only the Ontario Hydro Commission doing research on it, figured out it actually was less than 8,000 years. They had to know that because they were putting power plants on the upper river and didn't want them to fall into the gorge. Okay, I'm, I'm going to actually um, apologize for having to move through these. These are many other evidences of a young universe using, in many cases, uniformitarian assumptions against them. And I simply do not have time to talk about these. Regrettably, from my point of view, a great relief from your point of view, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. Um, this would obviously be a two-hour talk. We just need to spend a minute talking about these hominid fossils. This is the most disturbing, in my view, of all of the fairy tales that are told, with a paucity of data, with a mountain of assumptions, and with the intent to commit the sin of propaganda and indoctrination. They move in with open deceit in many of these early fossils. Piltdown man, a forgery. Nebraska man, built from one tooth. This is still Piltdown. There's the tooth of Nebraska man. This is the Illustrated London News in 1922, talking about Nebraska man, his wife, and the tools that they used. And the entire skeletal record is one tooth. Not only that, the tooth was a pig's tooth. It belonged to a peccary. Uh, we don't have time to do these justice. Ramapithecus had to be changed to Sivapithecus because Ramapithecus is not a hominid, he's an ape. The only place Ramapithecus survives is in textbooks and in children's introductions to evolution. In the real world of science, he doesn't exist because he's been shown to be a fraud He's, he's not a hominid, he's just an ape. Now, what do the... Um, is, what, this is an ape called Homo erectus. We now know that Homo sapiens is older than Homo erectus and ate Homo erectus. This is a number of, of apes that lived in China, mainly Java man, he was called also Peking or Beijing man, and these and turned, turned out to be the same kind of ape. And we know Homo sapiens is older, or at least was present at the time, and therefore this is not a predecessor to man. Look what they do, though. They use human eyes. Human eyes. 
Actually, I saw that guy last Thursday, I think. I saw those two people, too. Um, some of these people. If we exclude the possibility of creation, then man must have evolved from some ape-like creature. But, according to Lord Zuckerman, if man evolved from some ape-like creature, he did so without leaving any fossil traces of the steps of that transformation. Again, we could read David Pilbeam on the same admission. Even Richard Lewontin, who said we can't let a divine foot in the door, we can't allow any sort of supernaturalism, says despite the excited and optimistic claims that have been made by some paleontologists, no fossil hominid species can be established as our direct ancestors. In these museums, you can go to the Smithsonian in the U.S., I'm sure you can do it over here, they take the eyes of humans, the, the, the prosthetic eyes that we would give to someone who had lost an eye, and they insert it into these skulls, and then they make them look like part ape and part men. It's an entire artistic fabrication. Because apes, great apes, do not have whites to their eyes, when they, at least when the eye is open to its normal dimensions. They're entirely brown. So you put that white human eye in there and you see your cousin staring back at you. The problem is he doesn't exist. He's been created. It's a story. But it's a story of massive indoctrination and wicked deception. A person going in there who's not armed can be completely snowed by that, completely persuaded. I have a few slides as I'm actually just a minute over now and I want to come to some concluding ones which shows that dinosaurs are not as old as people thought. They have indeed died out, but ancient peoples knew of them. Remember, we have only dug up dinosaur bones in the last 200 years. So there's no dinosaur skeletons in museums that people 1,000 years ago could have gone to see. They would have known nothing about these creatures. They were all still buried at the time. So any knowledge that they show must be from another source. It must be from their own traditions. This is a North American petroglyph showing an Apatosaurus, Brontosaurus-type dinosaur. Notice the man in the upper left. These are not forgeries. These are acknowledged to be the uh, legitimate petroglyphs, petroglyphs, we call them, by secular scientists. This is from Angkor Wat in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Again, a Stegosaurus dinosaur in a carving that's around 1,000 years old. Again, the same thing in ancient Egyptian art. This is the uh, Kaku Yalanji Aboriginal tribe in Queensland. Not only did they understand the dinosaur, the plesiosaur type dinosaur you see there, but they obviously had understood its anatomy. They probably had dissected these, maybe hunted them down or one washed up on the beach. And they knew even about the inner workings of these animals. As you know, some dinosaurs still live today. Komodo dragon from Indonesia and the large saltwater crocodile. Uh, these can grow to be 25 feet in length and weigh over a ton. So, what does the Bible say about dinosaurs? They were formed around 4000 BC. They fell, that is, they were genetically reprogrammed, as we talked about yesterday with the fall. They were destroyed, most of them, in the flood, although a few survived. After the flood, Job describes two of them, Behemoth and Leviathan, in the last chapters of his book. Then they faded from memory because they were buried. And as one generation passed to another, the remembrance of dinosaurs either was lost entirely or it changed into fire-breathing dragons. Then they were found around 1800. They were dug back up, went into museums. Okay, well, that's the end of my discussion on dinosaurs. I can't say more due to the time. Two concluding segments that I'm going to go through quickly. We, are a, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of this present darkness. There is a conspiracy. We aren't being paranoid. There is a conspiracy. It is an anti-God agenda. And it has all the trappings of a religion. It has a prophet. It has a sacred text. It has relics. It has a martyr. It has a sacred creed. The cosmos is all that is or ever was or ever will be. It has a statement of faith. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. It has televangelists. It has a sacred shrine called the Large Hadron Collider. It has temples. They're called universities. It has priests' investments. It has priests who know how to come down to talk to the common man in Tweed. 
It has an origin story called the Big Bang. It has an apocalypse, excuse me, global warming. I think it has all the trappings of a religion, don't you? And it excommunicates. The question is to utter heresy, to invite an inquisition, and to face complete rejection and excommunication from academia. We can take the despair of a man like Sartre, who was an existential pessimist. Man is absurd, but he must act grimly as if he were not. Or we can take the words of Scripture. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. We walk in the flesh, but we are not waging war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but of divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against these cosmic rulers the cosmic powers over the present darkness. If we suffer for righteousness, we are blessed, but we want to be ready to give an answer for the reason for the hope that is within us. God, my brother, my sister today, wants your brain. He wants your mind. He wants you to use your intellect for him. He wants you to use it to understand him and his word and his world, and he wants to use it for the good of others. I begin with, end up with a graffito the singular of graffiti is graffito, correct? This is from Ephesus. It contains Greek letters, iota, chi, theta, upsilon, sigma. That spells in Greek, ichthus, fish. Jesus, Jesus. Christos, Christ, theu, of God. Huios, son, soter, savior. Jesus Christ, son of God, savior. This is an early graffito of Christian faith. This person was being creative because he showed, or she, whoever did this, that all these letters can be put into this shape. Iota, Jesus. The he here, Christos, Christ. Theu, the theta of God. The upsilon, huios, son. The sigma, soter, savior. And there it is. That's why you see the fish symbol for Christianity. That's what the world wants to do. That's what we've done this weekend. <laughs> That's my last slide, I think. Yes, it is. All right, so we've come to the end, and I went a few minutes over. I'm sorry. Uh, today's was too rushed. I apologize for that. But at least if you get the flavor for what I intended to present, you can go back over these slides or other materials that you can read about this and I think become equally convinced. Let's pray together and give God thanks for his own person, his son, his salvation, and all the blessings that we have.